Hey, this is Digital Byte Computing. Let's talk about tech and stuff that's interesting. But before we do that, please remember to subscribe and click on the notification bell to be kept up to date with everything that is going on with this channel. So my name is Emilio and I work in the IT industry. And today, this is what is happening and interesting stuff in tech. Today is the first day of June, 2020. And a lot has been happening in tech. Uh, today, we're gonna look at a number of things, a lot of stuff that's happened in the last month or so, uh, including challenges of working from home and what that sort of looks like. Uh, the increase in cyber attacks uh, all over the place. Uh, coronavirus contact tracing applications uh, and related technologies. Apple future releases, the rumor mill, uh, including AR glasses, Apple's AR glasses and other new devices, which should be pretty cool. We're gonna be talking a little bit about Trump and the whole Twitter debacle uh, and much, much more. So we are still in the midst of a pandemic, uh, although things are now starting to ease around the world, which is really, really good news. Um, and as you guys know, many, many companies around the world have uh, had their staff working from home over the past few months. Uh, you could be one of them. I know I'm one of them. A lot of people have been working from home a lot more than uh, usual. Uh, it's definitely different to what uh, a lot of people are used to, especially if they've never worked from home before. Um, some of you may already be used to working from home, working remotely. Uh, you already have a job that perhaps already allows you to do that, and that is awesome. So this hasn't really been much of a uh, change for you, but it uh, has been a change for a lot, a lot of people. There's a thing going on around whether this should continue in terms of the working from home. You know, ongoing working remotely could be a thing. A lot of companies, a lot of tech companies, a lot of other companies are talking about this. Um, you know, they're talking about whether it's, if it's been successful, why not continue it? You know, um, why not continue to work from home, work remotely? A lot of the tech, larger tech companies have been really talking and considering this uh, at great lengths. You know, personally, um, I think this is great. Um, I love working from home. I actually really love it. I find it to be more productive and I like the flexibility. Others don't like it. You know, there's isolation. They want to be around people, things like that. But here are, we're going to talk about some considerations. So here are some considerations. Um, if staff can work from home or work remotely, uh, do they have to be based locally? This is a really interesting thing. You know, if you're going to be hiring future staff, uh, can they be in a different state or could they be in a different country, international? You know, a lot of companies already have uh, national and international sort of uh, structures and that's how the company is sort of built. Um, but what about those companies that don't? You know, how does that work if you're going to be able to hire staff that are not even based in your own zip code, your own postal code? Uh, do you pay staff the same who are working uh, from home? as staff who are working in the office? What if they're working internationally in a different state? Some states have got higher salaries than others. How's that all gonna work out? That's very, very interesting. Here's something that's quite interesting is what tools will you put in place to be able to monitor your staff to make sure that they're doing what they need to be doing? You know, over the last number of months, monitoring software has skyrocketed. Uh, companies starting to work from home have really implemented a lot of monitoring software to be able to make sure that their staff are doing what they should be doing. Uh, and we're gonna, let's touch on a few things about what monitoring software um, can do. Some of this stuff is quite scary. Some of, some of you may already be uh, experiencing this. You know, it can record how long you spend on a website or a particular program, making sure that you're not spending too much time on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, you could take screenshots uh, at regular intervals throughout the day and then send them off to somebody, you know, every hour or something like that. It could be recording when you clock in and when you clock out. Um, you know, essentially a, a time card thing, you know, letting people know that you're working the full eight hours, tracking your location. Here's something that's interesting. A lot of monitoring apps have got apps that are available on your mobile phone and uh, your mobile phone has GPS. So you can actually know where you are and let you know if you're getting out. Um, being able to log in and view your computer live, you know, remotely log in secretly to see what's going on. Uh, monitoring your emails, searching for keywords in your emails. Are you doing work-related emails or are you doing personal emails? This is a little bit big brother, isn't it? It's a bit super big brother in my opinion. Um, you know, you can set up reports even to be sent out to your boss. Uh, set up alerts so that when something happens, you're trigger it, you know, it triggers something because you've been doing something that you shouldn't be that's not work-related, lets people know 
What do you think about this? I'd love it if you commented and let me know about this. I, I definitely would be interested to know um, what I know what I think. I know what other people think, but I'd love to know what you think. You know, many places that I've worked at um, previously have uh, software, including the place that I'm working right now, does have software that can do a lot of this stuff. But we have selected only certain features to be turned on. We don't want to be uh, too big brotherish with our staff. We want to allow some sort of freedom. You know, how do you guarantee staff to do work if they are working remotely? You know, I guess that's something that's very challenging. Um, you know, ethically, can you do a lot of this? Do you want to be able to trust your staff? So it's really something to, to consider. You know, something about uh, working remotely has uh, interesting positives and negatives. You know, will productivity be increased or decreased? You know, working in the office with real people, is that better than working remotely and just joining via a Zoom or a Microsoft Teams meeting? Quite interesting. Next thing is around cyber attacks. Let's talk about cyber attacks. Over this uh, pandemic period, um, cyber attacks have been going crazy. Uh, you know, is it because people and systems are more vulnerable? Maybe they're more naive when they're working from home. Or is it that hackers and cyber criminals just uh, have more time and they're just wanting to exploit it uh, a lot more than they would normally? Over the last few months, a lot of companies, a lot of industries have been getting affected by cyber criminals. Government services, medical facilities, hospitals, airlines. You know, EasyJet, for example, only recently was exposed, uh, had, had 9 million customer details exposed via, because of a cyber attack. RDP attacks uh, have increased. Uh, if you don't know what an RDP is, RDP is a protocol that Microsoft uses uh, to be able to allow generally IT people to be able to remote access systems and services. Um, RDP ports are often exposed to the internet. Um, over the firewall, you can open up ports for RDP, 33890 is the port, to be able to allow you to remote in to a system. Um, and here's the thing, scary fact, is that currently um, there are close to 5 million open RDP ports on the internet, or not open, but exposed to the internet. A lot of these could potentially be with easy passwords. And you can brute force in. You know, they could brute force dictionary attacks to try to guess the passwords, most commonly used passwords. You know, the volume of attacks for RDP has skyrocketed. Um, and frankly, I don't think RDP should be used very much on the internet at all. It's quite... Um, Surprising to me. And you can fix this quite easily by just turning it off, uh, having a VPN, and not exposing your prod servers over VPN, or over, over RDP. Things like malware, malicious software, has been on the rise. Uh, phishing emails, people receiving phishing emails with malware attached, um, directing you to fake websites, ransomware, you know, asking you to pay ransoms. All of this has increased over the last few months. SQL injection, so getting into the backend databases, uh, has also increased. It's quite interesting when you think about we're working from home, you know, we're all meant to be working together as one, yet cyber criminals have been uh, at it a lot more than before. Um, a lot of companies aren't using two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. You know, a simple password, uh, one single password is not enough. Uh, there is no second authentication uh, method. Uh, there's no code to go to your phone or via an authenticator app. Another thing is perhaps you do have VPN, but VPNs are insecure or there is no VPN. So people are able to get in a lot easier into the internet. A big thing that I personally think is uh, that home internets are generally insecure compared to a work. You know, at work, um, you're guaranteeing that your network and your firewall are set up and secure and set up correctly, right? Um, it's a lot harder to do this at home when you have all staff scattered around the place with their own modems, their own routers, configured a particular way with weak Wi-Fi passwords, neighbors using shared internet, all this sort of stuff. You know, it's more likely that people at home are going to also be working on personal things on their work computers. They're going to be surfing personal websites, personal emails, downloading software, malicious software from time to time. You know, someone that connects to VPN then potentially spreads this malicious software onto your corporate network because their poor security at home or poor practices when they're uh, working from home. Definitely something to think about. You can strengthen this quite easily. Let's talk about coronavirus contact tracing apps and technology. So what this is, uh, you may have heard of it. Um, essentially, it's an app um, that you install on your phone, Android, iPhone, uh, to track the spread of coronavirus. Sounds like a great idea. You know, all these people have the app installed. It communicates with other phones over Bluetooth um, that also have the app installed and lets you know uh, when you have been in contact uh, with somebody that has uh, coronavirus. Uh, sounds like a great idea. The problem is, it doesn't always work. Um, I'm in Australia uh, and our government and health agencies actually built an application uh, and we tried this. 
uh, and it looked like it was good. It was collecting information, but uh, there was problems that started emerging. Compatibility issues. iPhones couldn't work correctly. There was compatibility issues with Bluetooth being too far, being too close. There was a lot of stuff going on. Outside of Australia, a lot of countries were also trying this very similar approach with applications. Then, good news, our good friends at Apple and Google came together to help. Apple and Google came and coming together to help. Very, very rare um, that two of the largest tech companies, um, which are constantly competing, innovating against each other, uh, actually came together to help uh, the greater community. Came together and they built a API. Essentially, they developed uh, an API allowing better connectivity between their platforms. Allowing better connectivity between Apple iPhone devices and iPads and things like that and Android devices. Uh, essentially creating this API so that app developers, you know, in, in my case in Australia, we've got the government, the health agencies to be able to develop an app, now use this API and allow better integration with their apps uh, and provide better accuracy and reliability between these devices. So Apple and Google collaborating, awesome news. And in a related note then, the Google CEO, because of this and probably because of other things, um, he's actually said that in future, he's interested in partnering more with Apple to find better opportunities and better collaboration in future. So it's definitely very, very interesting. And I think it's a good thing. Rather than uh, competing as much, which is still important, let's come together because I think tech can grow and we can innovate a lot better that way. Let's talk about Apple releases and actual future Apple releases. You know, the rumor mill has been on overdrive. There's a lot of stuff coming up, uh, mid-year potentially. Uh, releases of a new iPad, a uh, 10.8 inch iPad, r rumors around a new iPad mini. Seems pretty exciting. You know, a refresh of the iPad is always good. But on the bigger news front, something that I'm super excited about, I've been hearing about this for a little while, um, but there's now more rumors around the Apple AR glasses or codenamed Apple Glass. Uh, they, they're saying it likely won't be released this year, but perhaps next year. Other people are saying even the year after that. But um, think of a pair of glasses that you put on and you see the real world as you normally would. Obviously, that's what you use glasses for to help you uh, and you can see what's going on. But it has digital content overlaid over the real world. So if you're thinking Google Glasses, well, it's not actually uh, like Google Glass. Google Glass um, is cool. It does a pretty good job, but it's not like that. It's actually way, way cooler and, and actually has a lot more, uh, you know, I guess, technology uh, built into it. Uh, think of it as uh, placing a pair of virtual reality glasses on, goggles on, um, and then seeing the real world at the same time. So you're overlaying um, virtual reality onto the real world. Um, you know, the, the, the rumors are saying that it could work, these Apple glasses could work with prescription glasses. I don't know how that will work, whether the lenses are Apple, you know, whether you're building something to the lenses or whether it's part of the frame, who knows, we'll, we'll go and see. Um, and then it's likely gonna be synced uh, over Bluetooth or something similar to an iPhone. Similar to my Apple Watch, my Apple Watch is synced to my phone for Bluetooth and make sure that it's fully integrated. But um, Apple Glass uh, definitely is very, very exciting and uh, definitely looking into that. Another piece of exciting news around the Apple front is the possibility of jailbreaking returning to the iPhone. Woohoo, you say, you like jailbreaking? So do I. I used to jailbreak uh, my phone all the time. Um, I wanted more apps. I wanted more customization for my iPhone. I wanted to do more stuff with it. So being able to do that again and do it hopefully easier uh, is, I'm very, very happy, very excited about uh, the possibility of future um, jailbreaking coming back. Let's talk about Trump tweets. Uh, everybody's been talking about this. Again, even I'm in Australia, I'm not even in America, we've been talking about it because it affects everybody. But um, you've likely heard the news that uh, some of uh, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, his tweets um, were fact, had fact-checked warnings placed against them by Twitter, essentially stating inaccuracies. You know, we're not going to talk about whether that is true or not, whether if it's inaccurate or not. We're not into politics here. We're talking about technology. So this is not a political show. So, you know, don't comment about that. I don't really care. Honestly, I mean, Australia doesn't affect me too much. Um, but interestingly, Trump fired back um, at Twitter and, and really everybody and signed an executive order uh, targeting social media companies, uh, essentially trying to defend freedom of speech and things like that. Quite interesting, if, if you ask me. I think it's going to have a bit of a ripple effect. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg then responded um, around this and essentially saying, you know, we're not uh, media companies, uh, should not be the dictating truth. That's not our point and our purpose. 
Could be true. I don't know. We'll see. So this is still a developing story as of this video anyway. Um, but it's definitely interesting. And I think it will have a significant ripple effect if this executive order goes through um, for what social media and really the internet as a whole um, looks like at the end of this. But you can read a, a lot more about this online. There's a lot more stuff going on online about this story. Here are a few more things uh, that you may have missed, which are also quite interesting. There's this thing called Formula E. I didn't even know what this was before reading this uh, article. It's quite interesting. But I think of Formula One, you know, race car driving. But this is uh, Formula E. E stands for electric powered. And it's electric powered car racing. And obviously, given the current pandemic, um, you know, businesses being shut down, events being shut down, Formula E went online and digital. So we're going to start doing a digital version over, uh, you know, a, a racing car game. And one of these Formula E drivers, a professional Formula E driver, actually went and grabbed an esports driver, essentially a pro gamer that's into this, uh, to race for him. Obviously, he was found out, hence why the news was broken. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Formula E driver was fined, he was disqualified. And of course, the virtual car racer, the esports guy, uh, was banned from all future esports races. What a world, what a world. Something that's super exciting for me, I love Microsoft and I love Linux. I also like Apple as well. But Microsoft is bringing Linux GUI apps to Windows 10. What does this mean? It actually it essentially makes it possible to run Linux apps on Windows without workarounds. You know, Microsoft didn't like open source, but now they're coming to the party. What does this look like? It's just an announcement for now, but it'd be very interesting to know what this looks like. Running Linux natively on Microsoft Windows? Good good news, I think. I definitely think so. Another big news, of course, if you're into podcasting, um, I'm into podcasting. You've heard of Joe Rogan moving from YouTube to Spotify, exclusively to Spotify. Definitely an interesting guy. If you've never heard of Joe Rogan, check him out. He interviews some of the most uh, interesting people in the world. You know, I've listened to a whole bunch of his stuff and it's fascinating, some of the stuff that he talks about with some of the most interesting people. So the movie is happening later this year. And of course, uh, it'll be free for Spotify users if you can bear the ads, of course. Um, so he used to be on YouTube, now moving to Spotify exclusively, but we don't really know uh, whether he will remain on YouTube in a reduced form, whether if it's partial episodes, snippets, I don't know. But it's definitely an interesting move for him uh, and really for people in podcasting. So this obviously is going to affect Apple, I think, because Apple and, and Spotify are obviously competitors. Um, but it's also going to affect YouTube, um, which is owned by Google, because they're losing a uh, you know quite a big um, voice in podcasting. So there you have it. Uh, that was, let's talk about tech and stuff that's interesting. Um, if you found this interesting, if you found this helpful, um, please let me know in your comments. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. And if you do like this sort of content that I'm releasing, I definitely would like to know about that. And please like this video as well. Subscribe to this channel, Digital by Computing, clicking on that notification bell to be kept up to date as new content is released. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching. We will see you next time.